Joining me today, White House reporter for BuzzFeed, Evan McMorris-Santoro, editor for The Wire, Gabriel Snyder, senior editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Diane Brady, and the host of MSNBC's Up with Steve Kornacki, Steve Kornacki. And joining us from Washington is The Washington Post, Ezra Klein. So Ezra, um, I'm going to start with you because, um, you know, there's always got to be sort of a cloud in every civil, silver lining, right? And so... That's why you go to me for the pessimism? I got go to go to you for the <laughs> pessimism. You're our pessimism <laughs> correspondent for today. And so there's been some focus on the disparity between the number of people who signed up, which is actually fairly impressive, 2.1 million, and the projections from the White House. A, what were those White House projections based on, and why do you suppose they've turned out to not uh, be quite correct? Sure. So, one, it's not just 2.1 million who signed up. That's the number who signed up through exchanges for private insurance. Another 4 million people have gotten Medicaid coverage, a lot of them because of the Obamacare Medicaid expansion. So the, the folks with new coverage now are about 6 million. It's really an impressive number. At this point, to, to go to your question, the number of people the administration thought would have signed up on the exchanges was 3.3 million. And the reason was um, they just adopted an estimate used by the Congressional Budget Office back in May. And in May, uh, CBO said that 7 million people would get uh, exchange-based insurance in 2014. And so the administration simply extrapolated that backwards and kind of put that on a kind of uh, a timetable. The problem was the Congressional Budget Office simply did not build in the idea that the administration would not have a working healthcare.gov website for two months. And so when you took two months out of that equation, and particularly when you took those first couple of weeks when the traffic was overwhelming and the public interest was overwhelming, when you take that out, of course your estimate is going to have to go lower. And that's it. It's just going to be lower. It is, I think, still unlikely we'll get to seven million this year. But on some level, it's actually not all that important. It's very important that they get the right mix of healthy and sick people in the, in the insurance pools. But as long as they do that, as long as they kind of keep premiums down into 2015, whether you hit 7 million a, by June of 2014 or you hit it in February of 2015 isn't the biggest deal in the world. The really significant thing here is one, people are being able to sign up, but two, and much more significantly, they need to make a system that is working well enough and that is good enough word of mouth when people ask others about it. That over its first three years of life, more or less, it does get the kind of sign up and it does get the kind of participation needed for it to become a, a near universal health care system. And on that, they're on a much, much, much better track than a lot of people thought they would be um, two months ago. And, and you know, as to the point that you made about the, the proper mix of healthy and sick people for it to work, um, there is some data right now about at least at the state level, the state level exchanges, kind of the age distribution, which is also important and gets to your mm -hmm. point about healthy versus sick. So, so the percent of enrollees under 35 right now in Kentucky is at 41%. Um, yep. In Washington State, it's at 18 percent. So you're actually seeing, at least at the state level, I mean, there was anecdotal evidence that in California, you're also seeing a significant share of people signing up are at that threshold age yeah. that are under and 35. How, at what point will we get to sort of get a bigger picture on that age distribution at the federal level? And that, how important are those numbers? That's a good question. That is something the Obama administration has not said when they will tell us, and it would be really nice if they did. <laughs> um, but this is very important. So that 40 percent number is about where they need to be. Washington State does not have enough young people in right now. But can Kentucky does. You've had real success from what we can see in California. And you need to see that nationally, too. Now, one reason the Obama administration is not releasing that data yet, and it actually is somewhat plausible, although I'd like to start seeing it soon, is that we expect, and we've seen this when Massachusetts did their reforms, and even in Medicare, when we had the Medicare prescription drug benefit unleashed in 2006, it tends to be the younger, healthier people, no matter what sort of level of younger and healthier they're at, they don't sign up at the beginning. They sign up sort of towards the end when the penalty begins to come in. So the expectation of everyone pretty much from the beginning here is that you're really going to get not just a surge in enrollment but the real surge in young and healthy people probably in March when the individual mandate begins to bite. Um, back in Massachusetts we didn't see the young people really sign up until the final month of do it without hitting the mandate. And the same was true in the Medicare prescription drug benefit when younger seniors didn't sign up until literally the last month they possibly could before hitting a penalty. The danger here, the big danger for the Obama administration is if they are so afraid that um, the mandate will be unpopular or that the, the Democrats in 2013 will, or will suffer for it, they don't publicize the mandate or they somehow carve out a larger set of exemptions from it. Because really, if the system is going to be strong in 2015, they absolutely need people to be afraid of paying the mandate in 2014. So in that final month or two months, they really do sign up and you do get the young numbers you need in order to keep premiums low in 2015.
All right, uh, Ezra, thanks. I want to uh, come out to the panel and, and start with you, Evan, and just on the question of, I think where Ezra just took us is where the politics are going to wind up being, right? So because Republicans seem to have sort of abandoned, for the most part, the repeal message, because now people actually have the insurance. It makes it a lot more difficult to say we're going to repeal it. But, but that issue about younger people being the later adopters and then the mandate eventually kicking in, it does seem to me that sort of that's where the politics now goes for Republicans, to convince those people to, to, to not fear the mandate, to take the mandate rather than take the coverage. Right, and we see uh, since the beginning of this whole process, we've seen that kind of fight go on, right? We saw some groups uh, create sort of fake Obamacare draft cards <laughs> that you could then burn and uh, not, you know, so it's not signing for Obamacare. So, yeah, there's definitely that pressure to, you know, to push on whether or not you should sign up or not. You know, I think people are trying to undermine the law there. Some people are trying to do that. But I do think that now it exists, as you say, it makes it harder to, dip, to make that happen now. It's harder when there's a, a tangible benefit to advertise, to, to tell people not to sign up for it. On the other hand, there are, other, there are a lot of other hurdles that are going to be part of this whole fight coming the next year as well. Uh, Sarah Cliff, in, uh, that works for Ezra, wrote a great piece today that, where she mentioned that um, access, that openness, like availability of doctors, availability of, of, of network size, co-pays, these kind of things, the actual mechanics of how Obamacare works now will be part of the political conversation, and some of that stuff is uh, kind of negative. For People who are supporters of the law in terms of having less access to, you know, smaller networks than you may have had before. You might lose your doctor, uh, higher co-pays you might have expected because of the way the law works. So there's a lot of fight now about it'll be about how healthcare works, I think, uh, as opposed to just signing up for it. And I, I mean, I'm wondering, Steve, if that, if that is, if, if that's an efficacious sort of way of going about undermining the law. I mean, the law is a fait accompli, but is it going to be a process argument that Republicans are left with? Because going into the year, they thought they had a really big picture, the Obamacare nightmare must be repealed sort of right. message, which is simple. <clears throat> but if it's going to be process, I'm wondering how that plays out. They, they thought healthcare.gov wouldn't work from November Ever. 2013 to <laughs> November 2. Right. right. There, there you go. Didn't anticipate this moment. I, I, you probably could have told them that that might not happen. I, I think there's a couple things. One is, first of all, what Republicans. I don't know what the long term. I can't see a world where where, where this thing works. And Republicans, at some point, they're going to have to get off the message. I don't see exactly when that happens. I think they're going to still try to get through 2014, basically on the repeal message, right. not having much to say about in, in terms of replacement. What I'm curious more specifically about though is those 25 states, those 25 states that have not expanded Medicaid at this point. You know, what, when's the, what's the first one to kind of go? Because I think we got news this morning. You see it up there that, that like Ohio, John right. Kasich in Ohio actually fought with some of the Republicans, fought with the right to get the, the Medicaid expansion in yeah. Ohio. There's news this morning that John Kasich has a primary challenge now, a Tea Party primary challenge. He's yeah. up for re-election this year in 2014. Those are the sorts of things. If, I don't know if this is going to be a serious challenge or not, but if this is the kind of thing that gains any steam, that gives pause to other governors. But if John Kasich is able to get through this thing fine, then it's sort of like, well, you know what? He was able to do that. Maybe right. I can get away with it. So that, to me, is sort of the next question. You, you mentioned it, it could be millions more right now enrolled if these 25 states would, would kind of get in line. Is that going to start to happen this year? Well, I mean, and that's the question that I've always had, is that the, the denial of coverage strategy, that we will just deny people this coverage and then try to encourage them to deny it to themselves, strikes me as a really complicated way of doing constituent service, let alone politics, right, for the Pro Republican Party. Well, it's been really interesting watching the Republican message for the last few months. They've been these critics of the of Obamacare, but they really, in a lot of ways, are almost uh, giving the blueprint of how to fix the program. And, and, and so I think that message kind of comes in on itself and, and, and it makes the repeal thing very difficult to, to continue to talk about because they're saying fix the, fix the website, um, improve some of these gaps in, in, the, in the coverages, it's some of the things that were never intended by anyone who drafted these laws. And so you actually have a lot, all these Republican talking points that are going to be a bit of a blueprint, but I don't think, you know, there's going to be much will in, within the House Republicans to draft a new uh, batch of policy. Right, I mean, to go back to the Senate Finance Committee, can you imagine, Diana, that the, the idea for the Republicans is to go back into the Senate Finance Committee and present a new bill and start this whole thing all over again? Well, and they won't do that. And the reality is all these programs are clunky and disappointing when they start. You know, John Boehner said, when it, last time he said horrendous, it was about the drug benefit that George Bush introduced. So all of these plans, even Social Security, was underwhelming to start. So I think at this point, people accept this is the status quo, and it has to be be fixed. The reality is we're in the most expensive and least effective health care system in the world. So that system itself has to be fixed as well. So some of the disappointment, I think, will be people coming into a system that has issues like access to doctors. That's not an insurance issue. It's a wider issue we have to fix as a country. Well, they have to sell that message, though, to people as that goes along. I mean, that, right. that, that, and they that's do. the trick, because as things come happen now, I mean, we've seen already the White House run a telegraph uh, 
whatever glitches might happen over the opening weeks of this new uh, benefit and now things are open, that's your insurance company, you know, your insurance company's fault. You know, right. you can't go to the pharmacy, it's your insurance company's fault. They have to try to get Trying that to put thing it back on the insurance off company. of them. And, yeah. and we have to go, but last word to you, Ezra, I mean, on the